So, welcome to this uh, class on uh, neuroscience of human movement. This is a class on receptors. So, more specifically, this is a class on uh, muscle spindles, a special type of sensors that are responsible for detecting changes in muscle length and changes in muscle velocity. Very, very special. Uh, these their function is critical for the functioning of the motor system. How do they work? So, this is uh, the class on muscle spindles. So, in this class, we'll however we'll start up with uh, the types of uh, receptors, and we'll focus on muscle spindles, the types of uh, spindles, how our uh, length and velocity is sensed, and uh, an important principle called uh, alpha gamma coactivation. So, what are receptors? Hmm. Receptors are special neurons whose properties, whose firing rate or some properties are changed in response to specific stimuli. So, this stimuli may be uh, you know temperature, so that may be thermoreceptors or may be some chemicals, chemoreceptors or they may be you know uh, these receptors may sense some mechanical change like pressure. So, pressure that is applied to say a part of the body or pain nociceptors or uh, those that sense mechanical stimuli, you know mechanoreceptors, those that sense changes in light, changes in you know the optical properties. So, basically receptors are in, in some sense uh, sensors of stimuli of different modalities. So, in general we can classify these receptors for philosophically we could uh, classify these receptors into three major types. Those receptors, those sensors that you know give us information that about what is happening within the body, inside the body, what is happening within the body, they are called as interoceptors that give me information about what is happening outside the body from the environment, things that are happening around me, I am able to see what is going on, I am able to hear that sound, some sound is coming, I am able to hear that. So, those are happening in the environment but it I am able to sense it, I am getting information about what is happening in the environment, right. So, those sensors that give me information, those receptors that give me information about what is going on around me or from outside my body are called as exteroceptors. Then there is the special class, the special group of receptors that give me information about where my specific parts of the body are in particular where my limbs are, where my uh, where is my hand and where is my leg, where is my arm and to how much angle I have moved my you know arm for example, information about the relative configuration of the body. In some sense I have I am able to find a difference between that angle that I am keeping and that angle that I am keeping, I know we know. For example, I could do this very simple exercise, I am going to close my eyes, I am going to do the following you know, I am going to first move my right hand to one angle and then I am going to move my left hand to the same angle. You will notice that you know they are approximately correct even though I am not seeing my hands. How do I know to what extent my right hand has moved? Anybody could do this exercise, you could also do this exercise and you will find that you are also able to re repeat this. What is what is better I am also able to do that for example, right. I am able to touch two index fingers with relative accuracy, well, not exactly tip, tip touching tip, but I am not missing it. I am able to do that with relatively you know sufficient accuracy. How am I able to do that? How do I know where my uh, right hand arm is traveling? So, for this to happen I should know where this the trajectory of the this fingertip, the right fingertip and the left fingertip should somehow adjust the, its trajectory in the 3D space in such a way that these two touch relatively complicated thing. For example, in computer science, in engineering, in robotics something uh, to achieve something like that would be you know substantial achievement would be great, it is not relatively complicated yet we know and we do this all the time. We take this uh, sense for granted, we are able to do this with relative ease that is possible with the help of this information is coming from a special type of receptors called proprioceptors. So, this class the entire today's class and 
probably the next class and also dedicated completely to the discussion of proprioceptors. Okay. So, one thing that uh, goes with uh, whenever we are talking about uh, you know perception, we need to talk about how is perception even achieved? What are the, are there some laws or rules that govern perception? It turns out that there are some laws and uh, rules that govern perception. Actually, this is the famous Weber hyphen Fechner law. Actually, this, this refers to two separate laws. First is the Weber's law that talks about the just noticeable difference not discussed on this slide is uh, the just noticeable difference is the smallest difference that a person can sense. Right. So, that depends on what the initial value was, right, what the initial sense was. Suppose I am holding this object, let us say its, its mass is 500 grams, I am adding 100 more grams. Now, you are asking me to find how much, how much weight has been added, I am saying some number. Suppose I had only 100 grams and I am adding 100 more grams, what would you perceive as a, a greater weight? So, I had 100 grams and if 100 more grams is uh, added, the chance is that I am going to perceive the case where the initial mass was uh, 100 as the heavier uh, load. So, there is in some sense the load detection load depends on the initial load. So, if I had 100 grams or and I add 100 more grams, I am going to perceive something. I am having 500 grams and I am adding 100 more grams. Note in both cases I am adding the absolute ad addition to load is only 100 grams, but the detection will vary depending on what the initial mass is. is it not? So, uh, that uh, goes to the Weber's law where that describes the just noticeable difference. Okay. Actually, the just noticeable difference is the smallest such change that can be de detected and the smallest such change that can be detected depends on what the initial uh, uh, value is. Okay. So, that is that. Then we go to Fechner's law where the relationship stimulus and the threshold of the stimulus uh, and the perception that is uh, detected is logarithmic. In other words, if the stimuli changes in a geometric progression, then my perception changes in an arithmetic progression. So, the difference is stimulus gets multiplied, every time the stimulus gets multiplied, so just describing what is geometric progression, you all know what is geometric progression and arithmetic progression, the stimulus gets multiplied whereas, my perception gets added. So, that is what uh, in an easy way of uh, you know uh, remembering what this logarithmic uh, relationship means. So, the perception changes as a logarithmic function of uh, the stimulus uh, with respect to the threshold stimulus. Okay. So, this law has come to be known as the Weber's Fechner's law okay, of uh, perception. Today's class we wanted to focus on uh, proprioceptors, I said uh, proprioceptors are uh, those neurons, those uh, cells that are specialized for body location body relative position sense right how is that uh, sensed there are different types of proprioceptors in today's class we will focus on one type we are going to call this as muscle spindles we are going to focus in, in you know on muscle spindles in today's class they have a special property these neurons near the spinal cord in a, in a ganglion and they have a special property in that they they have two branches of axons. So, this is one axon that is shown here, this is the other branch of the axon and there are two types of conduction in general in, uh, in neurons, there are two types of conduction. In general conduction from a, in a neuron happens from the cell body, this is the soma, this is the soma or the cell body. If the conduction happens from the soma to through the axon in that direction for example, that is called as orthodromic conduction. If the conduction happens through the axon to the cell body, from the axon to the cell body in that direction for example, that is called as antidromic conduction. In general neurons have one of these types, either neurons conduct orthodromically or antidromically 
but proprioceptor neurons are special in that these neurons conduct both antidromically and orthodromically. It is two axons, it is two branches conduct in two different directions. One of them brings information from somewhere to the cell body where it is processed integrated to some extent and then it another one carries that processed integrated information to somewhere else the other axon ca carries it from there. So, that means there is both orthodromic and antidromic uh, conduction that happens in these special neurons a case of uh, motor neurons right where uh, information from these neurons ca cause a movement cause a contraction of the muscle these neurons that cause or uh, these fibers that cause a movement or a motor uh, activity are called as efferent fibers okay. and those that sense information that is happening are called afferent. Okay. These two uh, the pronunciation of both are somewhat confusing one is afferent the other one is efferent. Okay. Efferent is the motor one and these proprioceptors are afferent neurons are afferent fibers. So, the proprioceptor neurons are special in that you know they have both orthodromic and antidromic conduction and they get the information from somewhere from a sensory ending from a point where I want to have the sensing and they send the information back to the central nervous system to the spinal cord. Actually what happens here at the spinal cord and where does the information go we will reserve for future classes. We, uh, our interest is in studying how muscle spindles alone function that alone is part of today's class. So, muscle spindles consist of two types of fibers uh, lots of terminology there are two types of fibers first is intrafusal fibers these fibers are those that are located on the central part of the muscles they do not participate significantly in the force production activity of the muscle. So, a muscle is composed of two types of fibers one is extra fusal fibers these are the fibers that produce force as we saw earlier the sarcomere uh, sliding filament theory excitation contraction coupling and cause of force that is being produced. So, extra fusal fibers produce force intra fusal fibers are also muscle fibers, but they do not contribute significantly to the change in the total muscle force. So, these are more useful for detection or force detection or length detection or something else detection of some uh, physical change. Okay. When the extra fusal fibers change in uh, change length the intra fusal fibers will also change length why because it turns out that the intrafusal fibers are located in parallel to the extrafusal fibers. There are and again there are different types of uh, these uh, fibers we will just first we classify this as uh, nuclear bag fibers and nuclear chain fibers those that are uh, you know those that have a bulging in the middle of that type right are called bag fibers and those that look like several chains are called as chain fibers okay. and there is a subdivision of these. These nuclear bag fibers are divided into two types the static nuclear bag fibers and the dynamic nuclear bag fibers and it turns out that uh, all these together are present in a muscle spindle usually a spindle is composed of uh, two or three bag fibers and uh, a different uh, number of uh, chain fibers usually around five chain fibers are present. So, two or three bag fibers and five chain fibers together constitute one muscle spindle and what do they do what is their function it turns out that uh, these intrafusal fibers I said stretch when the muscle is stretched right. So, when the muscle length changes when will the muscle length change when the muscle is stretched when will the muscle get stretched there are two re there are only two possibilities for the muscle to stretch first an external force is uh, stretching the muscle for uh, this is the kind of exercises you would do when you go for stretching exercises 
or you do mostly the type of exercises that we do in pilates or in yoga involve some amount of stretching most of those exercises are stretching exercises right uh, the in, in in many of these cases we what we do is we stretch against against non moving things is it not against the environment so in such cases an external force is involved this is one case in which you could uh, in which the muscles are stretched the other case is uh, the case where the antagonist is contracting so the usual example that we give is when i am doing this when i am uh, flexing the elbow or when i am reducing the angle between my forearm and the upper arm that is flexing uh, of the elbow joint when i am doing that the biceps muscle is contracting but its antagonist is the triceps that is getting stretched so why is the triceps getting stretched because the biceps is contracting okay so and our interest is in detecting this stretch we need to get a relatively accurate information about what the state of the muscle is and this uh, by the way this information needs to be obtained for practically all the skeletal muscles so lots of these spindles are present throughout the body every in all the mu muscles concerned so our interest is in understanding how this is detected how the stretch is detected so what actually happens is that so there are uh, these types of fibers that are located and they are all located in a capsule and then what also is present so these are the muscle fibers and uh, their properties what are the properties they are basically composed of these fibers but not just that we said that there is proprioceptive so that is this part that is this part but then information from this must somehow go to the proprioceptor neuron is it not so that means there is innervation there is innervation of or the neural innervation of these uh, fibers actually the uh, it turns out that their central regions of these fibers <coughs> are non contractile so they do not contract or they do not contract by much the central regions of these intrafusal fibers are non contractile whereas the polar regions the end regions are contractile so the central regions are innervated by the afferent axons coming in so the afferent axons come in and innervate the central non contractile regions of these uh, fibers so when and these these afferent axons have the property that when the fiber is getting stretched the axon also gets stretched and when the axon gets stretched stretch sensitive ion channels present on this axon cause a lot of influx of sodium causing an action potential in that axon and this action potential travels back to the soma okay so basically stretch sensitive uh, ion channels present on the afferent axons are getting activated when the fiber is getting stretched so the fiber gets stretched on top of the fiber are these axons the axons get stretched or the endings of these axons get stretched and the stretch sensitive ion channels are opened sending in a lot of sodium and causing an action potential in this uh, axons which which is then detected by the proprioceptor neuron okay these axons are are uh, innervating the non contractile central regions okay the non contractile central regions are innervated by the afferent axons is it not so the non contractile central regions when they are getting stretched the innervated axons produce an action potential okay. and uh, but then what else is also present are some efferent axons some other things are also there these efferent axons what they do they innervate not the non contractile regions but the polar regions the end points of these are innervated by efferent or efferent axons and these neurons are usually called as gamma motor uh, endings so 
this is different from the other motor neurons extra fusel fibers right the, are the force producing fibers are innervated by motor neurons basically the neuromuscular junction case that we saw is it not. So, they produce force and these motor neurons that innervate the extra fusel fibers are called alpha motor neurons and those that innervate the intra fusel fibers the contractile polar regions of the intra fusel fibers are called as gamma motor neurons. They, they, they perform some special function it is not clear what, the, what that special function is we will see in future slides. So, this is the, the architecture of uh, the muscle spindle they are composed of different types of fibers basically uh, back fibers and chain fibers and back fibers are divided further into two types dynamic and static and they are composed of a central non contractile region and a polar contractile region and they are innervated in the center by afferent axons and in the end by the efferent axons which is also called as a gamma motor system. Okay. So, an example that is given here is so these are these that are shown here these are the extra fusel muscle fibers and their fascicles. So, this is these those that I have circled with red are all the extra fusel fibers and uh, those that I am now circling with blue here these are the intrafusal fibers ok. So, what happens is that whenever the extra the muscle is getting stretched what happens the extra fusal fiber get stretched. So, or in other words this moves in that direction moves in that direction and so the intrafusal fibers also get stretched. So, the capsule becomes uh, stretched this capsule becomes stretched and uh, the afferent axons attached to these uh, capsules also get stretched and that stretch is uh, getting detected. But a question is what would happen muscle is contracting is it that this is going to when I said that these uh, channels are stretch sensitive there is no such thing as slack sensitive right because I can have I am having this thread when I am stretching this thread or I am having this rubber band say for example, when I am stretching this rubber band the more the stretches if there is a stretch sensitive sensor here the more the stretches more is the signal that I am going to get. But if I am slacking it I, it's, it's not possible for me to detect the amount of slack in some sense right. Is it that these uh, muscle spindles can detect only stretch from a 0 resting length but not contraction but not slack. Here is an illustration explaining the situation here there are three rubber bands right there are two rub red rubber bands these are the two and there is a green rubber band in between right. Let us assume that the red rubber bands represent the extra fusel fibers or the force producing fibers and the green rubber band represents the intra fusel fibers right the ones that are useful in measuring the length the amount of stretch that the extra fusel fibers take can also be measured by the amount of stretch of the intra fusel fibers. This is what we have seen. Now, how do you measure slack? Suppose the extra fusel fibers are contracting like that, right? Suppose they are contracting. How do we measure contraction or slack itself? That is the question. Now, in this case, what would happen? is when the muscle is contracting like that or when the extra fusel fibers are slack we must somehow ensure that the intra fusel fibers which is the green uh, band here remains stout and this is achieved by pulling at the end like this right. So, when I am pulling the intra fusel fibers at both ends are at the polar regions which is where the gamma motor neurons innervate. So, the gamma motor neurons innervate at the two ends or at the polar regions and they cause a contraction at the ends thus keeping the central sensitive region taut at all times. So, regardless of whether the extra fusel fiber is slack or taut the intra fusel fibers is always maintained to be taut. What happens is that as the muscle is getting contracted the extra fusel fibers move closer or 
you know become shorter in that sense, but at that time the polar regions of the intrafusal fibers are innervated by the gamma motor neurons. These gamma motor neurons are also getting activation in such a way that the polar regions that are contractile are getting pulled. So, these guys the ex and the outside the, the, the extra fusal fibers contract, but the those that are in the center expand get stretched in a, in a way by sending information by contracting the polar regions this polar region and that polar region effectively I am stretching by sending that information I am keeping the central sensitive region tout are sensitive to stretch. So, if I know then since I am the one since the central some from somewhere in the central system you are sending this command to the gamma motor neuron to contract the polar regions is it not. So, I know how much command I gave to keep this uh, polar regions contracted or to keep this uh, system tout. So, in some sense that is a gain multiplier I know how much information I gave. Now, whatever else in whatever else is the information received from the afferents from the from these afferents must be multiplied or must be you know uh, computed uh, along with the information that I gave to the gamma system. A combination of these two together will give me the exact state of the muscles. So, what actually happens is that whenever uh, the extra fusal fibers are activated extra fusal fibers are activated how extra fusal fibers are activated by alpha motor neurons by these neurons that are shown with a solid line here. Right, by these alpha motor neurons those that are shown with a solid line here whenever they are activated the muscle will contract, but at the same time I when the muscle contracts I want to key have accurate information of their length there is a simultaneous activation of a different motor neuron these are the gamma motor neuron what are the what is the gamma motor neuron doing it is going to activate the polar regions of the intrafusal fibers. Okay those that line is shown with the dashed line here is it not this dashed lines. So, the intrafusal fibers are kept simultaneous active. So, what is the difference between the alpha motor neuron and the gamma motor neuron alpha motor neuron are large diameter myelinated axons whereas, gamma motor neurons are small di diameter myelinated axons. So, we saw early on or in one of the earliest classes what we saw was that you know myelination increases conduction velocity we want to have the greatest uh, conduction velocity for sending information to the to the muscles to perform movements. So, alpha motor neurons have large diameters and they are all myelinated and gamma motor neurons in comparison have relatively smaller diameters, but they are also myelinated. So, they are going to contact with slightly lower very slightly lower velocity because uh, the, the information is coming from the spinal cord to the muscle of interest is not. So, they are uh, small diameter myelinated axons and they both uh, and they are both simultaneously activated by a process called alpha gamma coactivation whenever uh, alpha motor neuron of a muscle is activated there is simultaneous activation of its gamma motor neurons. So, that whenever this muscle is I know what alpha motor neuronal uh, activation will do what alpha motor neuronal activation will do it will contract the muscle is it not it will cause uh, the extra fusal fibers to contract by excitation contraction coupling. At the same time I do not want to lose information about the length of this muscle. So, I want to stretch the intrafusal fibers I do that by sending information to the contractile polar regions of the intrafusal fibers that I am doing with the help of a different system with the help of gamma motor neurons and they are simultaneously activated that is why this process is called as alpha gamma coactivation. A special process not discussed so far a special case not discussed so far is the case of fusimotor system or the skeleto fusimotor system. This is the case when distal muscles of the limbs 
I want to have very good sense of what is uh, going on. In those cases, what it does is uh, there is a special system not discussed as part of this. This system is called as the beta motor neuron system, different, relatively less numerous, relatively rare, relatively rare uh, when compared with alpha and uh, gamma this beta motor neuronal system. What this does is, so that I am going to draw with a different color here. Suppose this were uh, are, are a distal muscle of a limb, say the hand for example. In that case, you have a special neuron, okay. that neuron is going to come like that and you know go like that. What it is going to do is it is going to innervate the extrafusal fibers here and also the intrafusal fibers. This is a special case. Extrafusal fibers are usually act, you know innervated by alpha motor neurons. Intrafusal fibers are usually innervated by gamma motor neurons. A special case is the case of a fusion motor system where only in some cases relatively rare cases a neuron innervates both the extrafusal fibers and the intrafusal fibers of the same muscle. What would this do? So, as soon as the contraction, command for contraction is given to the extrafusal fibers, a simultaneous command for contraction of the contractile polar regions or stretching of the intrafusal fibers is given. So, this has collaterals to both extrafusal fibers and intrafusal fibers, a very special case. Um, but the more common case is the case of uh, the alpha gamma coactivation. So, basically beta fusion motor system or uh, beta motor neuronal system is a special case of the alpha gamma coactivation system. I could activate uh, what is the difference in the difference is that the alpha motor uh, neuron is a large diameter neu neuron, gamma motor neuron is a small diameter neuron, beta motor neur neuron is a medium diameter neuron. This is one difference. The other difference is alpha gamma coactivation. Although the command is given simultaneously, these are given to two different neurons. Here, but in the beta case, command is given to a single neuron. It is uh, dividing its command to both the extrafusal system and the intrafusal system. So that means in the reliability of this system, the beta system is going to be more than the reliability of the alpha gamma system because there are two uh, you know two elements that are involved two independent elements that are involved in the alpha gamma system there are two neurons in this case there is only a single neuron uh, one neuron innervates both the extrafusal and intrafusal uh, thing so that means there is more reliability why, why would this be needed because we use the distal part of the limb to interact with the environment all the the all the interactions that we do with the envir environment are with this is it not anything i do i am i am writing with the pen i am clicking this clicker drinking water whatever i am doing i am doing with the distal part so the manipulation needs to be more controlled or for, for some reason it is not clear why evolution would do this but this happens and we saw how this happens so as soon as uh, the alpha system causes uh, you know contraction this middle portion gets uh, stretched. So, this is the extrafusal fibers they are getting contracted right. They come closer to each other reducing this uh, reducing this length whereas, uh, the intrafusal fibers go farther away from each other increasing their length thus increasing their sensitivity. If I know what the sensitivity, what the command that was given to the gamma motor neuron and if I also know, I also know what the input from the sensory afferent is. This is coming to me through the proprioceptive system. This informa information from the gamma motor neuron is coming to me from the motor system. A combination of these two must give me a, a good sense of what the actual state of the muscle is. Note the motor neurons and the afferent neurons are located in two different parts of the spinal cord. We said early, early on that the motor neurons are from the ventral part of the spinal cord whereas, uh, the afferent system is usually located in closer to the dorsal portion of the spinal cord. So, ventral means suppose I were standing on four legs, 
suppose I was standing on four legs that part of the body that faces the ground is the ventral portion or this part this is the ventral portion that part of the body that faces the sky or the roof is the dorsal portion. So, when I am on this that portion is the dorsal portion and this portion is the ventral portion. So, the ventral portion sends the from the ventral spinal cord you get the motor uh, neurons and from the dorsal spinal cord you the innervation comes for the afferent or the or the sensory neurons okay. So, they are not uh, they are not coming from the same neuronal pool they are coming from two different pools of the spinal cord yet something else can happen uh, that is the part of reflexes which we will discuss in uh, future classes. So, how do they function and important how do they still stretch uh, how do they sense stretch that is the question how do they function. There are two uh, types of uh, these uh, spindles the primary spindles and the secondary spindles. The primary spindles are uh, sensitive to both muscle length and uh, velocity of shortening they are composed of the dynamic fiber and uh, uh, back fiber or chain fiber. So, they can detect both velocity and uh, length by the use of the dynamic uh, fibers. So, the secondary spindle endings are sensitive to length, but not velocity these are composed mainly of the static back fibers and uh, chain fibers the chain fibers are static anyway. So, suppose there is that length and then a length is uh, that length is varied linearly for some time and then a new length is arrived suppose that is happening right. What will the the secondary ending do is that as the length changes the frequency of firing of the secondary ending will increase at the new length this is the new length at the new length that frequency will be continued to maintain for as long as this length is going to be maintained for that long this frequency of firing is going to be maintained. In other words the secondary ending is a pure is a pure uh, length sensor whereas the primary ending is slightly different more complicated than that what it does is uh, depending on the. So, as I am increasing this length the firing uh, increases in the primary ending then I am maintaining a new length then the firing decreases. So, here this is a code of this is a frequency code of uh, the time rate of change of this length or the velocity of this length. Well, to ex explain this better let us consider two cases. Uh, let me consider a case suppose I am stretching this a little faster you know like that then I am reaching the same new length and I am maintaining. What would be the response of the, the primary ending that is the question what will happen is that there will be all these black lines and in between there will be more red lines as in there will be more lines why because I am stretching them faster and that will happen only until this point, but not these two ok. So, there will be more lines between these two. So, or another possibility is that I could stretch slower I could do that. Then what will happen is that this will become a little farther away from each other these lines could become a little farther away from each other. So, from from this what I can uh, deduce from uh, from this what I can understand is that you know by looking at the frequency of firing of the primary spindle ending I am able to say what was the velocity with which uh, this stretch was happening. So, if the frequency of firing is high so basically the velocity is encoded in the frequency of firing of this uh, primary. Uh, so, if the frequency of firing is high then the velocity will be high if the frequency of firing is uh, low that means that the velocity is low. A question is what will then happen if I am releasing like this to the this. So, in this case I am releasing from a stretch what usually happens is that this a, re a release from stretch the sensitivity the static sensitivity 
of the gamma system is increased whereas the dynamic sensitivity is reduced. It turns out that as we have uh, said that there are uh, static fibers, we have said that there are static fibers and dynamic fibers. It, uh, it turns out that the gamma motor neurons also come in dynamic and static. So, there are two types of gamma motor neurons also. It turns out that I can selectively change the sensitivity of the dynamic system or the static system. If I am going to unload what this does, if I am going to release from a stretch what this does is that the static sensitivity of this system is increased to a great extent or the static gamma motor neurons are firing whereas, the dynamic gamma motor neurons are not firing so much so their dynamic sensitivity is reduced. Thus, what happens exactly during this release is that the primary motor ending becomes silent practically there is no uh, input during release from a stretch. However, what happens then you are worried oh then how will I detect length there are others to do that job for us. There is still the secondary sensory ending I said this is only the primary there is still the secondary sensory ending which detects length alone as the during release and during stretching during both stretching or release from a stretch whereas, the primary motor uh, ending can detect velocity and length and become silent during uh, the release from a stretch. Okay. So, so, in summary what we have seen is uh, we have seen receptors we have we discussed a little about uh, Weber Fechner law and we saw proprioceptors these are neurons that are special that uh, have uh, two axons one that receives information from the sensor sensory or ending. So, wherever I want to have uh, the sensing at that part I have a sensor from there I am receiving information that is one axon in which conduction is happening in antidromic direction or conduction is happening towards the soma and then something integration is happening at the soma and then information is going to the spinal cord in orthodromic. So, these are special uh, neurons that can that have both antidromic and orthodromic uh, conduction and that uh, sense information of the relative body positions and we saw muscle spindles and the types of uh, fibers nuclear bag, nuclear chain static and dynamic and uh, the important principle of uh, alpha gamma coactivation that causes uh, the polar regions of the intrafusal fibers to contract simultaneously with the contraction of the extra fusel fibers thus uh, maintaining the central region tout in such a way that you are always sensitive to stretch at no point does the muscle spindle become uh, loose. There are other receptors that are not uh, discussed uh, in this class the other receptors are uh, most importantly the Golgi tendon organs not discussed this will be discussed in future class and cutaneous receptors and uh, what are called as joint capsule receptors or the joint articular receptors what do they do what do this what do these things do all these thing, things together we will discuss in the next class and uh, how do they help in motor control we will discuss in future classes. Okay. So, with this we come to the end of this class thank you very much. <laughs>